good afternoon everybody on behalf of ikfai family from faculty of allied health science i welcome you all during this pandemic situation we are quite fortunate that we can arrange this type of online webinar for the benefit of the healthcare professionals who are acting as a covid warrior in this situation we are organizing this type of seminar and i really thankful to all tripura government doctors association and trained nurse association tripura state branch they have wholeheartedly cooperated with us and we for this reason we are landed at this day in this seminar today we are very much grateful that we got the lot of support from our honorable pro vice chancellor sir professor vikram bhandar our registered sir and we are quite fortunate enough that our director of medical education government of tripura is already joined with us sir i welcome you in this webinar sir we are fortunate that we have the eminent speaker from the united kingdom he is dr manavendra halder he is a renowned anesthesiologist from united kingdom sir i welcome you uh, i welcome you in this seminar also i am quite fortunate to welcome dr rajesh sheparman who is the associate professor from the government medical college avertola tripal hospital i welcome you sir as a resident speaker in this seminar i also welcome ms ms papi mahajan who is a director nursing education under director medical education of tripura i welcome madam for this seminar now i i hand the mic to our honorable pro vice chancellor sir for <coughs> giving his welcome speech after that i will introduce all the resource person who is, who has joined today in this seminar we are, we are quite enough fortunate that dr manobendra haldar who has given his consent to participate in the today's web he is a renowned anesthesiologist from united kingdom <coughs> he is in the university hospital of derby and barton national health system foundation trust of uk since 2002 he is in intensive care medicine training under m in new delhi and university college hospital london he is a med he got his medical education from calcutta medical college and after that he is a examiner of royal college of anesthesia london dr halder has contributed very much level in in, a, in teaching and training in uk he is a tutor in hospital for all the training college of london in royal college he organized lot of regular training session and train the patient management and passing the fellowship dr halder is a stimulation trainer and course director of critical incident course training go through using stimulation at the different state of the stimulation center which is very renowned in uk he is a leading anesthesiologist for the quality care and patient safety dr halder is a principal investigator of national research project and gave trainees into research dr halder is a principal investigator and of the national research project i welcome dr rajesh debarma who is a associate professor government medical college agartala dr debarma has done his medicine graduation in from reims imphal in 1989 and after that he passed his mmd from 2000 in that from reims itself dr debarma is serving the government medical college since 15 years and he has so many research publication <coughs> in the renowned field of medicine i welcome you sir i also fortunate to welcome ms bapi mahajan who is a clinical tutor and serving the government of tripura last so many years now i welcome you all of the renowned participants and resource person 
for this webinar. Now I hand over the mic to our Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor, sir, to welcome you all. Sir, please. Good afternoon, Dr. Chinmoy Bishas, Director of Medical Education, Government of Tripura. Dr. Manavendra Haldar, keynote speaker of today's program, consultant anesthetist, University Hospitals of Derby and Barton, National Health Service Foundation Trust, Barton on Trent, UK, and college tutor of the Royal College of Anesthesia, London, examiner of FRC exam examination, London, Dr. Rajesh Dev Barma, associate professor, Agartala Government Medical College, sister, Mrs. Papi Mahajan, tutor, nursing education director, and also director of medical education, government of Tipura, and president, Tipura Nursing Association of India, Tipura State Branch. Dr. A. Ramanath, register of Ikhwai University, Tipura, Professor Shoman Mukherjee, all faculty members of Ikhwai University, Tipura, all participants, doctors from all Tipura Doctors Association and all sisters, nurses from Tipura Nursing Association of India. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great privilege to welcome you all to this today's webinar on role of healthcare professionals in critical care during ongoing pandemic, pandemic situation. Or we are all going through very crisis across the world and Tripura also no exception. So in this case, we as university fortunate that we are able to contribute to a extent for the value addition to the healthcare professional, both nurses and doctors. And in this case, we are also very fortunate that we have got expert from England, UK, who is already working in the critical care area. So we have been discussing these issues more than one year back. Also when earlier healthcare minister was there on the dias, we have been discussing. And we recently also discussed with Professor Shoman Mukherjee and he is also uh, spoken to the Tipura Doctors Association who also very positively uh, responded. And even nursing council also came forward. So it is a very good gesture on the part of everyone to assemble in this in this webinar, where this webinar is being organized by ICFI University Tipura and also Tipura Doctors Association, all Tipura Doctors Association. We are having in our university also a department called Allied Health Science. Health science program. There we are running four programs: BSc in emergency medical technology, BSc in cardiac care technology, BSc in dialysis therapy technology, bachelor in health information management. And also from last year, we have started another program, auxiliary nursing midwifery. In fact, for conducting such programs, we had a discussion with Dr. Haldar also about this emergency medical technology, especially cardiac care technology. We discussed how we can involve. And also one year back also we discussed about how we can involve him for, uh, uh, for enlightening uh, and also having networking with the doctors of our state so that ultimately the patients, ultimately the consumer, the, the patients, they get the benefit of good medical care, uh, um, care uh, developments which is happening across the world. So we are very happy that this program we are able to conduct here and I wish that this program will be of great help to the, to the healthcare professionals of our state. In this case, in this, this is an opportunity also to convey uh, our regards and respect to the healthcare professionals, all, all paramedical science, nursing and doctors, everyone who are uh, helping all over the world also in our state to help the mankind for saving their life. We really salute for the frontline warrior of, of uh, healthcare professionals who are serving across the country, across the world, across our state. So I, with this, I welcome you again all to this program. And I wish that this webinar will be a great success. Thank you very much. I now request Dr. Shoman Mukherjee to take over. Next. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your valuable speech. 
sir in presence of all the renowned uh, speakers and all the healthcare professionals i really thanks to all tripura government doctors association and tripura training arts association and special thanks goes to dr manavendra haldar and dr chinmoy bishash who has given their valuable time for this seminar sir for for everyone knowledge i am sharing that ipa university has started its journey in 2018 under the direction of professor biplav haldar his guidance we are on this day today we are arranging this type of seminar we have already discussed with the government of tripura dr biswas is there he is continuously guiding with us so it is enough fortunate that dr biswas has joined today now i request dr professor chinmoy bishas sir sir please inaugurate and give your valuable speech for this today's webinar hand over to dr biswas thank you professor shoman mukherjee uh thank you sir and thank you to your uh, vice chancellor uh, sir uh, good afternoon everybody it is my proud privilege today to be amongst you who are the doyans of the healthcare professionals uh first of all i hope you and your all your families are staying well and a hearty welcome to all of you in this international webinar jointly organized by the faculty of allied health science ifa university tripura along with all tripura government doctors association and trained nurses association of india for arranging this type of academic webinar for the first workers in this covid situation the topic of today's webinar is very interesting as per the current situation role of healthcare professionals in critical care during the ongoing pandemic situation corona virus uh which are no, known to the professionals as covid-19 is an infectious disease caused by a newly discovered coronavirus most people infected with covid-19 virus will experience mild to moderate respiratory illness and recover without requiring special treatment older patients patients with comorbidities like underlying medical problems like cardiovascular diseases diabetes chronic respiratory diseases cancer are more likely to develop serious illnesses covid-19 affects different people in different ways most infected people will develop mild to moderate illness and recover without hospitalization most common symptoms are fever dry cough and tiredness less common symptoms are aches and pains sore throat diarrhea conjunctivitis headache loss of taste or smell rashes on the skin or discoloration of fingers and toes serious symptoms are difficulty in breathing or shortness of breath chest pain or pressure loss of speech or movement at present tripura has the third best recovery rate from covid amongst all the states and union territories of india this is all thanks to the dedicated service of our healthcare professionals healthcare workers doctors nurses physicians paramedics administrators and the government and under especially the dynamic leadership of our honorable chief minister and health minister and our honorable prime minister government of india and government of tripura are taking all necessary steps to ensure that we are prepared well to face the challenge and threat posed by the growing pandemic of covid-19 the coronavirus with active support of the people of india we have been able to contain the spread of the virus in our country most important factor in preventing the spread of the virus locally is to empower the citizens with the right information and taking precautions as per the advisory is being issued by the ministry of health and family welfare government of india from time to time recovered cases sharply overtake active cases differences between recovered and active cases are crossing 1 lakh i've already talked about the dramatic and very good a uh, status of tripura recovery as in terms of all india rate role of critical care in this pandemic situation the year 2020 will be remembered in history as the year of the covid 19 which has wreaked havoc all over the world critical care also known as intensive care is the multi professional healthcare specialty that cares for patients 
with acute and life threatening illnesses or injury most of us will experience a critical illness or injury either as a patient family member or friend of a patient sometime in the life critical care can be provided wherever life is threatened at the scene of an accident in an ambulance in a hospital emergency room or in the operating room most critical care today however is delivered in highly specialized intensive care units various terminologies like critical care unit intensive therapy unit coronary care unit may be used to describe such services in a hospital critical care team involves members of a highly skilled team consisting of nurses physicians and other healthcare professionals which care for the patients nurses who specialize in critical care take care of the very sickest of patients critical care nurses need specialized skills and knowledge and must be vigilant to protect their patients from serious complications in some cases the nurses must also provide care for the patients who are not expected to survive of all members of the healthcare team nurses may be the person who spends most of the time with the patient and their family in view of the above this webinar aims to bring together academicians researchers medical professionals from different parts of the state and the world to share their respective perspectives regarding the role of the healthcare professional in critical care professional during the ongoing covid-19 pandemic situation and the path ahead do not panic always wear mask wash your hand to protect yourself and your family and maintain a healthy life and always follow the instructions given by the ministry of health and family welfare and the government of india from time to time lastly i congratulate the organizers again for arranging this type of event so the paramedic personnel nursing and allied healthcare personnel can share their experience stay safe stay well jai hind thank you sir thank you thank you sir for your valuable speech we are assuring that ifi university will uh, train the generation for the future your future covid warrior for the state and as well as for the country now <clears throat> i am requesting dr manavendra haldar to deliver his speech on this today's topic which is a very burning topic and he is very much efficient and working in british health service so sir we are eagerly waiting for you and for your kind concern i am giving you the information that out of today we are already having 154 registration where different nursing professional healthcare professional doctors allied health science workers are already joined with us sir now i hand over the mic hand over the mic to you sir dr haldar sir thank you thank you good afternoon to you all thanks for the introduction and thank you professor mukherjee for inviting me in this webinar and thank you chairman and pro vice chancellor professor halda to allow me to speak in this webinar and professor chinmoy biswas director of medical education government of tripura sir this is my great honor to be part of this webinar my hospital based in midland uk which serves a population more than a million two main sites we have in our hospitals which are 8 miles apart both sites have emergency department last week we crossed a landmark in discharging 1000 patients who were covid positive we were badly affected with covid during march and april time after the london hospitals which were very much affected as well we lost two consultants colleague who were infected with covid one from the ent department and the other one from the emergency department and we also lost two healthcare assistant and a cleaner you know trust this is very upsetting 
for all the healthcare workers at the hospital and put our morale very down. But we had a lot of support from the trust and the community which kept us going. Here in the UK, now alert level is three out of five. Five is the risk of healthcare services being overwhelmed and lockdown began, but we are now at level three, which means viral is in general circulation and gradual relaxation of restrictions. I must do the declaration of my interest. I am not a virologist or expert in COVID-19 by any means. I have been actively involved in organizing plans and managing COVID-19 patients as one of the physicians in my hospital. Today, I shall talk about my experience in organizations and management plans for COVID-19 in anesthetics and intensive care department, and also cover the management in the intensive care unit. As you all know, COVID-19 is a recently discovered coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. A lot of its characteristics still unknown and is always evolving new treatment and guidelines. In the vast majority of affected individuals, the infection causes very mild flu-like symptoms. And whilst asymptomatic infection has also been described, some of those infected will develop severe life-threatening disease. I was involved in those group of patients for their management. It taught us new way of working. Many doctors redeployed in different roles, which they never done it before, came to help in the intensive care unit due to increased workload. All worked in a 12 hour shift pattern we stopped all the elective procedures in theaters except cancer surgery. We learned to work wearing personal protection equipments, we call it PPE, for hours at a stretch. The virus spreaded very, very fast throughout the world, as you know. In the timeline of the outbreak of COVID, the first patient reported on December the 1st, 2019 at Wuhan, China. 30th of December at Wuhan, the source was traced back to a seafood market. 2nd of January, 2020, WHO named the virus as 2019 NCOV. January 19th, WHO issued warning, the virus can spread human to human. And that was quite important in terms of management and treatment. 30th of January, WHO declared it public health emergency of international concern, FIC. Pandemic was declared on 11th of March, 2020, and it changed our whole world, the way we live. Clearly, our world has changed over the past few weeks, none of us experienced in our lifetime. We received here tremendous community support from the Rolls-Royce company and local schools manufactured visor, visors for the hospitals. Shops delivered free food to us. Whole nation clapping for the NHS workers every Thursday evening. And you feel you are not alone. You are all working together. It reminds me the famous Liverpool Football Club song you will never walk alone. Even a hundred years old gentleman, Captain Tom, who recovered from fracture neck of his femur surgery during the COVID, he started raising fund for the National Health Service. After discharge from the hospitals, he raised 23 million pounds for the NHS just by walking in front of his house. This is huge inspirations for the whole country. So I'm just talking about how the virus spread. It spreads by inhalation of infected matter containing live virus or by exposure from the contaminated surfaces. 
aerosol generating procedures create an increased risk of transmission of infection. We must know what is aerosol generating procedures because we need to take precautions for every procedures we do in our workplace. Aerosol generating procedures in generally called AGP is all the tracheal intubation, tracheostomy, non-invasive non ventilation in the ward, and mask ventilations. This all causes aerosols in the air. When the disconnections happens from the ventilatory circuits during the use, while tracheal extubation happens during the extubation time, during the cardiopulmonary resuscitations, and also during bronchoscopy and laparoscopic surgical procedures, all produces lots of aerosols, which causes spread of infections. So we need to do, have the personal equip, protection equipments during the management of the patient. The personal protection equipment, PPE, it varies what to wear during different situations in the hospitals. And there is a guidance for that. So in the intensive care unit, we have different kinds of PPE, whether in the ward, we have different kinds of PPE. So those are the PPE we need to have in a guidance, what to wear and when. And this is going to protect all the health care in, in the hospitals. And the hospitals usually make all the PPE arrangements for all the doctors and healthcare assistants. Now I shall talk about how we started the planning when it started. Any plan will need to be fluid at that stage because the things are always evolving. The sub this always subject to change as things evolve like a battle plan. We are dealing with a rapidly evolving situation in relation to coronavirus. Every day we are getting new guidance. Every day we are getting new information regarding the virus. It was key that we all work together as professionals to adapt to the changing situation. So communication was a major component in this kind of situation. Our approach was establishing a common group, first of all. In the hospitals, there was three common group. One was the gold, which was at the level of the board. And then we had a silver divisional level. And at the end, we had a bronze uh, level common group as well at the departmental level. And there was daily meetings with each and every stage and information was sent to the gold level. Common group also set the objectives and plans, what to do in the hospitals on every day by day basis. And th there'll be a huge amount of communications you need to create during this time. They started working through the objectives. First of all, the objectives was to make standard operating procedures, SOP, we have to make new guidance for the coronavirus. We have to make a guidance for the infection control, how we can be prevented the patients as well as the doctors and healthcare workers. And also need to make a guidance for the PPE, personal protection treatments. And these PPE is going to protect the healthcare workers. And at the same time, it protects the patients as well. So PPE guidance, there are the WHO guidance there. And we have to follow and make it our own guidance, whatever available in our own hospitals. And that's what we did in our own hospitals. We have our own PPE guidance, and which was distributed to different departments. We also started training in different aspects of new COVID-19. As you know, this is, there was a lot of redeployment of doctors in intensive care unit because huge amount of patients was admitted in the intensive care unit. And we needed a lot of different doctors to work with us. Came from orthopedics, came from general surgery, came from medical 
world and they were not used to working in the intensive care unit so they all needed training in there in terms of communication our chief executive officer ceo sent out regular emails and sent out live video conference and also sent out sitrep i'm not sure whether you understand sitrep because this is a new concept that came out from the battlefield situation sitrep is a daily report which describes what is happening in the whole trust for example the sitrep report used to tell us every day how many covid patients are being admitted in the hospitals how many covid patients are in the intensive care unit how many of them are intubated how many patients are being discharged and how many patients are being are dying every day and also it reported us about the sickness covid sickness how many doctors and nurses being sick and they are out of work and that will help us to manage our workload workforce as well workforce obviously was a big issues that time because of this sickness so we identified availability and expertise in staffing groups allied to the critical care like anesthesia surgical and medical specialties specialist nursing ex critical care staff rotating junior doctors to work in the intensive care unit helping donning and doffing personal protection equipment and also we need to prone the patients for 12 hours interval in the intensive care unit and which required huge number of personnel to help in proning the patient we formed mobile emergency rapid intubating team we call it merit those it involves an anesthetist it involves a technician who will be ready in the hospital's 12 hours shift pattern to go and intubate patients in all over the hospitals in the emergency department in the ward and in the intensive care unit so staff subgroups were quite important how to make to make work in different areas in the hospitals at that pandemic time infection control champions was there in different sites of the hospitals and they were helping in making ppe available and also make sure that every doctors and nurses they follow the infection control policy it is important at this time to empower the team to their responsibility and challenging others to follow the policy then we started training training all the junior doctors all the consultant anesthetists intensivists recovery nurses theater nurses plus theater technicians in different aspects like how to don and doff ppe <clears throat> don means wearing and doff means how to take it off safely as well guidelines were prepared and we rehearsed on how to do intubate in a covid positive patient and we used simulations to train the doctors and nurses to do that and also we had a practice how to prone because proning is not an usual things we do every day in intensive care unit but these patients were quite helpful if we prone them their oxygenations improved profoundly so proning was new uh, concept came out in this covid situations familiarity with the itu equipments with the infusion pump with the ventilators and also we need to have everybody need to have basic critical care nursing and medicine knowledge so all this training were going on at the same times so these are all part of the preparations for dealing with the covid pandemic at the beginning which started in march in our hospitals before management to the patients quickly i will talk about covid 19 underlying pathophysiology covid 19 appears to have several phases early phase of respiratory failure primarily affects the vasculature of the lungs procoagulation leading to the microvascular pulmonary thrombosis lung compliance is generally very good 
is not an issue to ventilate the lungs, but in later stage, the respiratory failure, they involves ARDS and the bacterial pneumonia. And that time, ventilation becomes a huge problem. So initially, ventilation not a big issue, but slowly it developed to ARDS, and we struggled to make the oxygenation better in those patients. And that stage, pruning helped quite a lot for our patients here. The key features of severe COVID-19 is hypoxic respiratory failure. We have seen in, I've seen in emergency department, young patients gasping for air, and we had to jump in to intubate in those very, very sick patients. Patients with severe disease may also develop progressive multiple organ failure, like kidney failure and heart failure. The current mainstay of treatment is supportive care for this treatment because there is no definite treatment still available for us. Most of the patients needed oxygen. The shortage of oxygen was a national issue at a stage. We had oxygen supply failure situation in our hospitals and hospitals at that stage diverted all the emergency to our other sites. It will be necessary to work with the local oxygen engineering team to understand the limitations of your local system, which is overwhelmed with so many patients are having oxygen therapy. Assessment should be made of the number of outlets that can be simultaneously supported by the central supply of oxygen and the location of those outlets. The hospital engineering team can determine the flow rates that can be achieved and types of ventilator it supported. The problem is because huge amount of oxygen is being used, the liquid oxygen is not getting enough time to be as gaseous forms and deficit comes there and then fails to supply the oxygen in the central pipe system. Communicate to all the staff about the requirement to reduce the oxygen consumption through avoiding hyperoxia and eliminate the oxygen waste. Oxygen therapy guidelines was produced and generally aim for the saturation of oxygen for the patient 92 to 96%, although the target may be lower in some patients group as well. Avoid high flow oxygen delivery devices there is no survival benefit compared to conventional oxygen therapy, and the risk of environmental viral contaminations may be higher due to aerosol generations. Eliminate the waste by ensuring oxygen flow meters are switched off when not attached to the patient. Cylinders filled and kept in reserve to facilitate transfers and emergency use. Non-invasive ventilation was used in the ward. Use of CPAP or non-invasive ventilation should be confined to the short period of time using a well-fitting interface mask. As a bridge to invasive, in, intense, in, invasive mechanical ventilations, because non-invasive ventilations only can breach that gap only. For some patients, non-invasive ventilations will form the appropriate ceiling of care and they may not need to be prepared for invasive ventilations like intubations and ventilators in the intensive ther therapy unit, depending on the case of the, of the uh, situation. It is preferable to deliver non-invasive ventilations in an isolated environment, especially in a neutral pressure room because this can spread the aerosols to the healthcare workers and to other patients as well. If possible, an antimicrobial filter should be located to the ex expiratory limb of the non-invasive non non ventilation device. I will talk about a bit of mechanical ventilation in the intensive care unit. Aggressive ventilation in the early phase may adversely affect the later outcomes. The starting PPE and tidal, 
the tidal volumes, the PEEP should be around 10 and which appears to be satisfactory for many patients at the initial stage. As I mentioned before, proning the patients should be considered early in this sort of patients to support the vasculature of the lungs. Using the cutoff PF ratio less than 150 millimeter mercury for pruning is ideal. Using pruning team because you need at least minimum six people to prune the intubated patients safely in the intensive care unit. So you need to have a pruning team on regular interval and pruning usually done 12 to 16 hours overnight every day. Pulmonary vasodilatations may provide short-term benefit and pulmonary vasodilatations are being done with nitric oxide or nebulized or intravenous prostacycline. But this has got very short time limitations. It probably gets refractory after 96 hours or so. Cast formation and plugging the small airways can happen in the intensive care unit and which can be affected by the dry circuits. So that's why we need to have a humidification of the circuits, which will be very beneficial in this sort of patients. Using the checklist to make sure the, hum the, the heat and moisture exchange filters, HME filters, doesn't get clogged on a regular basis, we need to check them. Make sure every 12 hour we check them, as it is important in the context of reduced nursing ratio in this sort of scenario, where probably huge number of patients come into intensive care we need, we are not expecting. Severe upper airway swelling in some patients may make the extubations difficult at the end of ventilation. So using dexamethasone prior to extubation, having nebulized adrenaline available with surgical airway expertise available like ENT surgeons available on site, a mobile airway team sometimes helpful. Make sure if they need reintubations, they are available. So reintubation rate within 24 to 48 hours was quite high in this sort of patients. And in our experience, probably 50 to 60% patients needed reintubation. So delaying initial extubations for longer than usual may be sensible options in this case. We have to have renal support for a lot of, of this kind of patients, renal injury, has been more common in these cases, which was anticipated around 20 to 35% of ITU patients. Renal microthrombi or even direct viral injury to the renal tubules, conservative fluid strategy may be the reasons for this. Careful attention to adequate hydration and use of lower PEEP may help. PEEP means positive end expiratory pressure. Consider commencing therapeutic anticoagulations from the beginning with low molecular heparin or unfractionated heparin will be useful. At presentation to hospitals, many patients are significantly dehydrated. This may contribute to the higher than expected rate of acute kidney injury and also increase causes ventilation perfusion mismatching, VQ mismatch. Balanced crystalloids solutions should be used for the acute resuscitations of shocked COVID-19 patient. Once patients have been adequately resuscitated, the aim should be to maintain euvolemia. Careful use of fluids towards euvolemia may be beneficial in early phase disease to prevent renal failure. Antibiotic use should be very judicious in this case. Consider not commencing antibiotic empirically at presentation. Continue to follow local antimicrobial policies, guidelines, which you have. Continue to practice good antimicrobial stewardship with regular review to stop, descalate, or switch on to oral or enteral route. There are some reports of later aspergillosis and candida infections on intubated patients in the ITU. 
There's another thing that happens in COVID-19 patients, it's called cytokine storm. It's, in this disease can be fatal due to an overreaction of the body's immune system called cytokine storm. We see a lot of patients coming with neutropenia. They're coming with high ferritin level and had a DIC picture in their blood, blood reports. Methylprednisolone has a role in this sort of patients. When all the ventilation strategy fails, you know, intubated patients, then we refer these patients for ECMO therapy. We haven't got ECMO in our hospital, so we have to have send it to a specialist centers for ECMO therapy. We also need to think about the routine medications management because this is the time where there will shortage of important drugs can happen. And to prevent the shortage, we have to have, think of the alternative drugs we can use for. For example, in ITU for sedations, normal protocol is using propofol, fentanyl, or adalfentanyl. But in this situation, we have to think of using midazolam and morphine infusion. For muscle relaxant, it's important not to use important routine drugs, atracurium, cisatracurium, because these are, will be very less available at that time. So we have to think of old medications like pancuronium and rocuronium. <clears throat> we have to use vasopressors, noradrenaline, and if we haven't got noradrenaline, I think we have to use second line drugs, adrenaline for inotropes. Cardiovascular system is, was not a big problem most of the time. They only needed hypers for sedation-related hypotension treatment with metraminol or phenylephrine. Stress ulcer prophylaxis from intravenous ranitidine, you can switch on to PPI if ranitidine is not available and stop once enteral fit started. There is some hope for specific treatment for COVID patients now. There's a recovery trial from Oxford came up um, last few weeks ago. The recovery trial, over 11,500 patients had been enrolled from over 175 NHS hospitals in the UK. A total of 2,000 patients were randomized to receive dexamethasone 6 milligram once per day, either by mouth or by intravenous injections for 10 days. And they were compared with 4,000 patients randomized to usual care alone. Dexamethasone reduced deaths by one third in ventilated patients and by one fifth in other patients receiving oxygen only. There were no benefit among those patients who did not require respiratory support with dexamethasone. No clinical benefit from use of lopinavir or ritonavir in hospitalized COVID-19 patients studied in the recovery trial. We all know hydroxychloroquine trial, it stopped after withdrawal of two very, two important papers came out in Lancet and Journal of American Medical Associations due to data mismanagements. So we're not sure where we are with hydroxychloroquine uh, tablets in this management of COVID. Remdesivir and Fabilavir, is, there's no control trial showing benefit yet. So we don't know what, what to use exactly at this time, any antiviral drugs. New claims every day, including, I think we all <coughs> know the controversy happens in India, Patanjali, I think, we have to be very careful at this time not to get from uh, any source uh, for any kind of management and treatment. We need to look for randomized control trial. Then otherwise it's not useful at all. It's going to be very fatal in some patients. My talk remains incomplete if I don't mention about ethics in managing resources during pandemic such as this. Our decisions should be guided by the ethical principles, fairness, 
duty to care, duty to preserve resources, transparent decision making, and accountability. To protect against moral injury and to provide support for the individuals, doctors, and nurses, difficult decisions regarding admissions, resource allocations, and withdrawal of life sustaining treatment should ideally be made by more than one clinician within a multidisciplinary <laughs> These decisions should also be discussed with the patient and their representatives where possible. Decisions should be aligned to the local or government guidelines and should be documented in a clear manner. Hospitals ethics committees can also help with particularly difficult decisions, especially where there's disagreement between the clinical team and patients or their representatives. Now, in UK, in our hospitals, we are in this next phase of our, after our acute crisis. This, we have already crossed that acute crisis. Now, our to planning how to work in a world where there will be significant COVID-19 presence for many months to come. This will test our resilience as an organization and as individuals. We'll be looking at how we use our buildings, how we can create a separation of patients' flows for those with COVID-19 and those with other needs who are coming for normal elective procedures or cancer surgeries not infected with COVID. How we can help our people and the public observe the social distancing in our workplace. So we produced green and red pathways. Red pathways for COVID-19 suspected or positive patients and green patients are who are negative COVID and who had isolations. So those who are coming for elective procedures, now they have to have 14 days self isolations at the home and they will have a COVID test 48 hours before their elective surgeries. And they will go, they are not going to be mixing up with the red pathways. So there will be two different sites for this kind of patients as well. So this is a huge amount of task we have to go through at this time. Obviously there's some good things came out from this COVID pandemic. The pandemic has also acted as a catalyst for change. We are working differently in so many ways, some for the better, which we'll want to keep for future working pattern. In our hospitals, our discharge process have been transformed with patients able to leave within a couple of hours once the clinical decisions has been made and earlier used to be a day. In our outpatients, we have seen a dramatic shift towards telephone and video consultations, which are more convenient for patients and also helped us to reduce the numbers of patients attending our hospital. There will always be a need to see some patient in person, but this is a change that we and our patients will want to see to be maintained. There is also virtual clinic in happening in our hospitals where the doctors, physicians, and other healthcare professionals sitting together on the computer, looking at the patient's notes and decide their following treatment plan. And also we are having online teaching, learning all the time. I think we have more opportunity now to have knowledge and understanding toward the world with this online teaching and learning platform. So with these notes, thank you all for listening and stay alert, control the virus and save lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for very much enlightened speech. And in one way, if I can sum up that during this COVID situation, I think that a lot of medical students who have joined today, they are already very much enlightened after your speech. You have highlighted on the drug therapy during this COVID treatment. You have highlighted the comorbid patient like on the cardiovascular, renal disease, 
which we are facing in this our country especially in eastern part and you are also highlighted the patient centric management during this covid time sir thank you very much for your very much informative speech as a healthcare professional i have now been teach from different different webinar that now the discharge policy of the hospital has already been changed which you have already discussed on your lecture it is very much helpful for the healthcare professional who are managing the healthcare uh, health institution and you are also highlighted that now it is coming in india in very good way like the telephonic consultation that is called as the telemedicine recently our government of india has regularized this type of telemedicine which you tell that this pandemic situation has taught us sir thank you very much and i really uh, grateful that our medical students who have joined with us especially for the paramedical student they might be have some different questions i request all the participants if you have any question please put it on the chat box and after that we we'll share it to dr manavendra halder because one of our another speaker dr he is waiting uh, on the line so i request dr rajesh dev parma sir kindly start your speech very good doctor afternoon to everyone uh, thank you organizers uh, for giving me chance to talk in this seminar on role of healthcare professionals in this critical care during ongoing uh, pandemic situations uh, to begin with my talk uh, this covid 19 is uh, spreading globally as well as in india uh, who has already declared is a pandemic situations uh, coronavirus is one known virus for many decades uh, simply uh, we know it uh, was causing simple upper respiratory tract infections but this sars cov 2 uh, is totally a different uh, strain of virus uh, causing severe disease in humans and increased morbidity and mortality uh, in human beings so this covid 19 situation is uh, is giving us an unprecedented demands on our healthcare systems Uh, our health facilities and workforces are currently uh, burdened or inundated by a plethora of activities related to COVID and certain non-COVID situation, which is very important in this context. Indeed, so uh, there is a chance that uh, there is a lapses in managing non-COVID situations like diabetes, hypertension, coronary disease, uh, strokes, etc., which are short, falling short in, in many of the hospitals, including ours. Biologically, what we know about COVID-19 is it depends. Uh, what we know about this is there are four main groups: alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Uh, this beta groups are mainly causing this COVID-19 uh, pandemics. My point of focus, my talk of uh, mainly focus on uh, comorbid situations like diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, and Uh, strokes, etc. Those who are having chronic respiratory diseases. So, if I start with uh, COVID-19 with diabetes, uh, what is important to know for us is it is the case fatality is increasing in certain age, certain groups of people. Uh, certain groups of people like those who are having diabetes, hypertension, uh, cardiovascular disease. Coronary artery disease, stroke, chronic lung disease. Uh, analysis of various uh, studies, I would say, or better say, uh, some observations uh, till date has demonstrated that uh, if we consider the mortality rate uh, in, uh, in normal, the normal individuals without any comorbid situation is only just three percent. If we consider mortality rate in patients with diabetes, hypertension, that mortality rate rises up to ten uh, percent. So uh, it is prudent to address those uh, comorbid situations and has to be taken uh, very carefully when they are especially infected with COVID-19. So what is the main problem in uh, with those comorbidities? Uh, it is uh, likely that health-seeking behaviors are deferred in many situations that probably because of 
social distancing and what is the community belief is uh, they, they, they feel uh, that the uh, healthcare systems are probably infected with coronavirus so health seeking is delayed or deferred for some reasons which is actually not true so that is uh, we need to focus on covid and related situations and also need to continue non covid situation uh, tackling the non covid situation also so we have to build up people trust in healthcare system to deliver these essential health services and also minimize the increase, uh, risk of morbidity and mortality in other health conditions so what is our experience about ebola breakout uh, uh, ebola ebola uh, Ebola period, so uh, it has been observed that uh, the mortality was more more due to death uh, because of measles, malaria, HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, diabetes, and hypertension rather than Ebola itself. So it says that we need to address those non-COVID illness besides this COVID management so that we can just uh, facilitate those chronic disease sufferers. To uh, get our services so that our mortality in other diseases do decline. What happened in diabetes uh, is uh, something special. So it's very much uh, well known that the case fertility is increased during, uh, in, in patients who are suffering from diabetes mellitus. It has been found that there is in high blood glucose in the uh, in the patients. Uh, the increased glucose control concentration are always there in airways in patients. So in virtual studies, in virtual studies has demonstrated that increased glucose concentration in pulmonary epithelial cells significantly increases chance of infections and replications of this coronavirus. So in vivo also it is possible that there will be increased coronavirus infection and replication those who are having hyperglycemia. So this hyperglycemia situations and uh, increased morbidity and mort mortality was also demonstrated in 2002 with SARS as well as in 2012 with MARS which was uh, seen in Saudi Arabia. So it has been found in patients who are having diabetic and hyperglycemia, the lung function test deteriorates gradually and that is also a confounding factors uh, that the virus will be more morbid uh, on patients who are having diabetes mellitus. It has been found in case of uh, diabetes, there is a uh, certain, certain uh, enzymes which is uh, known as angiotensin converting enzyme 2, which is the receptors for coronavirus protein to bind and enhance their enzyme to the cells. So, this AC inhibitors, uh, so, sorry, angiotensin converting enzyme 2. Uh, uh, is primarily regarded as anti-inflammatory and it also regulates the blood pressure. So whenever there is acute hyperglycemia, whenever there is acute hyperglycemia, thus this angiotensin converting enzyme 2 is upregulated and it facilitates the binding of this coronavirus and enter into the tissue and going to the damage. So if you consider so it's a it's a it's a it's a risk factor. Obviously, a diabetes patients who are having uh, having uh, having a chance of getting coronavirus for special attention to be paid by healthcare workers. If I consider about coronary artery disease or cardiovascular disease, so cardiac injury uh, is more severe when they get coronavirus infected, and those who are having heart failure already, it has been found that these receptors. Angiotensin converting and their two are overexpressed in patients who are having heart failure. If it is so, so there is more chance of coronavirus get attached to this essay uh, uh, angiotensin converting and the receptors and replicate and causes further some special types of cells in the cardiac, the cardiac heart that is called cardiac pericyte and causes endothelial injury and more chance of developing heart failure. I would like to concentrate on some certain case definition what we follow uh, that is as per well, guideline right of uh, uh, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare uh, that was published in 13th of this month or uh, June. <clears throat> there are uh, three categories of uh, patients we deal with uh, the um, probable case, suspected case, and confirmed case. Everybody probably knows this what is actually the suspected case. 
uh, a patient who is having respiratory symptoms, that is fever, cough, shortness of breath, and having a troubling history, or locating in a, uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in, a in a in an area where there is already a community transmission, uh, giving uh, 14 days prior to symptom onset, or a patient having respiratory features, and uh, in the or in, in a contact with a confirmed probable case in last uh, 14 days. So uh, these are these are the cases which we suspect to have uh, COVID-19 and uh, further investigate to uh, confirm the diagnosis. Probable case is the second group where uh, we probably uh, the result is inconclusive. We go for an artificial the result is inconclusive with having suspected uh, symptoms and exposures and in certain situations where tests could not be done for many reasons. We consider them as a probable case. Confirmed case is a group where uh, it's already a laboratory confirmed case of COVID-19. So, what we do in situations uh, like treating those mild cases, moderate cases, and severe cases? Mild cases in our place, uh, we are just treating them in uh, COVID care center. We uh, we all collect the detail. Histories of the patients. We inquire about comorbidities. We uh, we examine the vitals, the pulse oximetry, the SpO2. Mild cases are usually treated with uh, uh, symptomatically like uh, antibiotics and adequate nutrition. Hydration is must for all those cases. Hydroxychloroquine. Uh, uh, Sir Haldar was talking about as per last guideline, even in mild cases, in certain Groups of individuals, we are uh, we are still advocating hydroxychloroquine in the role of 100 mg twice daily for past day and 100 mg daily for uh, next five days. So the groups whom we advise hydroxychloroquine is those who are having more than 60 years of age, patients with comorbid situations like hypertension, diabetes, chronic lung disease, chronic kidney disease, chronic liver disease, cardiovascular disease, and obesity. In those strict groups, we still advocate hydroxychloroquine for five days, even if the patient is having mild symptoms. Those who are having moderate symptoms, which is defined as uh, respiratory rate, when there is uh, hyperthermia or respiratory rate more than uh, 24 or 24 uh, per minute, and as you know, goes down uh, below 94% at the room here. So, this we treat in dedicated COVID health centers. This will treat in dedicated COVID health centers. We examine for only liver investigation, chest x ray, blood count. Uh, besides this, we also go for uh, CBC, CRP, fatigue level. And oxygen support are necessary for those moderate cases where the SPO2 goes below 92%. We go for oxygen. And uh, we specially use nasal prompts, masks, or masks. Whatever is available in conventional oxygen therapy is sufficient. Sometimes aerobic chronic is essential for this. We monitor all patients with 12 ECGs. And CRP, D dimer, again, we are practicing nowadays to test the severity of the patients. Definitely, we are giving in moderately severe cases hydroxychloroquine uh, in the same dose. Last, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare guidelines says methyl prednisolone uh, in the dose of 1 mg per kg is, is, is uh, well, 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 well prescribed. Nowadays, for at least three days, if the patient present present in 48 hours of symptom onset. So, methyl prednisolone is a new addition in moderate patients. We're giving it for three days in the dose of 1 mg per kg for three days if the patient present in 48 hours of symptom onset. And all patients who are having moderate illness, anticoagulation is must, and we are uh, uh, prescribing low molecular weight heparin in the dose of 40 mg subcutaneous daily for five days or plus, as long as patient is uh, having symptoms. So, heparin is one addition in moderately sick patients. We are regularly prescribing in moderate in those patients. So, this concept of using heparin probably has arisen from. Uh, uh, Increased chance of coagulability and developing DIC in patients with um, COVID-19. So uh, it was in questions uh, from, uh, from from the very beginning of the COVID-19, and nowadays in uh, in the SIM guideline they have advocated to use this normal uh, level according in the dose of 40 milligrams of injections for at least five days.
So we are practicing this in our situations in our hospitals also. So uh, severely sick patients uh, requires uh, highly supportive therapy and monitoring. Uh, management of uh, respiratory failure and RDS. So uh, recognize severe hypoxic uh, respiratory failure and uh, the RDS is very uh, very much essential. Um, we give high flow oxygen therapy. Sometimes we may need to go for 10 liters per minute. If patient develops uh, gradually increasing oxygen demand and patient is in shock, we need to go for emergency ventilation or emergency ventilation that are on. Condition is shock. If patient goes to shock, is it not too much? When patient is in uh, a developed shock or uh, septic shock, we uh, advocate distalloid, uh, use of distalloid is a go for fatigue. Uh, 50 ml uh, per kg uh, in the first hour. In general, it is, uh, those is around 20 ml per kg in the first hour. We will give it a uh, waiting for around 1 to 2 hours. If there is no improvement in uh, volume conditions, uh, we will be to the window of the process like a monitor in the septic shop. I have a question. Use of I have uh, a question. Hello, sir. Yes. I request all the participants kindly mute their mic. So after this lecture discussion, we will put the question to the respective speakers. Please continue. So uh, uh, septic shock should be identified uh, early so that we can uh, we can manage those situations uh, with the discharge to begin with. Uh, like normal saline or legal lactate, you can give. Penicillin, you can always prescribe in patients who are having septic shock or hydroxychloroquine. cortisone. Uh, use of antibiotic is controversial in mild moderate case, but definitely we use it uh, when patient is severe uh, in septic shock or sepsis. We use it by prospective uh, antibiotics. And uh, heparin is well advocated in severely sick patients too. Uh, we always use uh, those antibiotics. Uh, regarding the newer agents like Amitazivir, Toclizumab, which is still uh, an underrepic uh, query. We are not using those uh, drugs, not, in, not yet available in India. Uh, Amitazivir uh, is probably is not uh, available in India, and so does the Toclizumab we are not using. What is uh, our experience in our state? We are having already 1300 cases. And around the world of these cases have already recovered. We uh, probably got more of the patients are asymptomatic or mild symptomatic. Uh, only few cases uh, had moderately sick patients. Uh, now in our centers, who dedicated COVID healthcare centers, we are having around 13 cases. Most of them are having. Uh, so in those. Uh, uh, symptomatic treatment only. So, besides uh, this managing uh, uh, this uh, critical care illness, every uh, situation demands to manage the essential uh, care, which is essentially uh, important to uh, reduce the morbidity and mortality in non COVID situations like chronic illnesses. Uh, those essential services are uh, like prevention of communicable disease, uh, particularly vaccination program. Service related to maternal health, child care health, pregnancy, childbirth, uh, care of vulnerable populations like young infants or adults, and supply, yeah, maintaining the supply chains uh, for ongoing management of COVID and other chronic illnesses should be maintained. Uh, uh, and we should maintain all these critical elements, whichever coming in our hospital, uh, should be maintained in one non COVID centers. Management of all, all emergency healthcare services is mandatory. Certain services uh, like uh, certain programs, certain meetings which related to health may be deferred in this lockdown situations. But uh, essential services like vaccination, maternal and child care, 
uh, those has to be maintained in this covid situation uh, we are doing so uh, we are learning we are learning every day some new new things basically we started with dealing with uh, uh, some asymptomatic patients in our state of tripura uh, so uh, now we are we are we are landed with some uh, critical illnesses uh, in, in in our centers now uh, so like yesterday we got a patient uh, who requires an rescue uh, pedic every 2 hours a pancreatic carcinoma patients uh, covid positive in our uh, dedicated covid hospital so uh, every 2 and 2 hours to every 2 hours giving a rescue pedic is a problem uh, is a danger on healthcare workers but we are getting it out so uh, every healthcare workers uh, in this situation have uh, some right uh, of themselves itself uh they should uh, they should have uh, uh, they should be provided with all information instruction and training and so that they can take care of their occupational safety health they should have a uh, refresher course uh, on on this current situations uh, current situation to tackle at times uh what is important we find whenever whenever we deploy new staff new recruits new doctors young doctors that uh, learning and talking of PPE is very important which we are teaching them in our center before they enter into covid care centers and uh, they should be always um, uh, supplied with uh, all all required protective equipment uh, for their safety so uh, appropriate working hours is very important and they should uh, need a break uh, it's very difficult to deploy someone in, to do, do some duties in covid care centers and uh, we are managing it uh, out of all difficulties and we are maintaining um, daily hands with them whenever they are inside these covid care centers uh, uh daily hands like we are using this whatsapp uh, virtual video conferences uh, to maintain the in patients uh, we are uh, we are observing and monitoring from outside and what is the uh, what is what they should do actually uh, all healthcare workers should um, maintain the operational safety and health procedures use provided protocols uh, assess triage and treat patients uh, we always uh, assess the situation and do triaging and treat the patient respect um, the dignity and they should be learned treat they should be learned that and they should maintain patient uh, confidentiality uh what we are facing uh, in many of many times this, uh, this after doing this uh, uh personal protective equipments are uh, kept here and there so they should be thought about this proper disposal of these equipments in a, in a given centers and what is very important for these healthcare providers are uh, starting from the uh, consultant to asha workers they should know uh, to self monitor their illnesses uh, that is very important whenever they are active in, uh, in certain situation Uh, any development of sore throat cough, they should uh, they should inform to the higher authority, and they should know that sample isolation is very important, and they should report their uh, illnesses to their managers or their higher peers if it is so. And it's very important uh, to isolate themselves uh, from the uh, other staff. Uh, what is important, uh, I would say. Um, covid-19 is a new one it has come to us all of a sudden in the last part of uh, last year and the situation is uh, getting uh, graver and graver india has reached already almost 6 lakh people 12000 has died we probably were not equipped with to deal with the situations to begin with we had some hiccups in our state to maintain the supply chains to have manpower behind the scenario now we are coming up slowly and our state a small state which has approximately 1300 cases are handling the situation uh, up to our satisfaction so far we had we had only one death and that is also uh, probably because of various covid situation patient was coming every day we are learning about the situations 
and we are tackling accordingly. Uh, I will not extend my talk. Here yeah, I'll just uh, uh, stop and say thank you to the organizers. I'll be rather pleased to uh, give some uh, answer to the queries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Debarma, that you have you. spent your valuable time for this talk, and you have highlighted to us that how the Tripura state is working on COVID, and it is very much true that though we are in a very small state and with a limited number of resources, with the two medical college, we are fighting against the COVID like you're the corona warrior, whatever you people are doing, it is a salute to all of you. And Dr. Debarma had highlighted how the medical management they, for the corona, corona patient, they are doing in the small state. Thank you, Dr. Debarma. I request all the participants, if you have any queries, I have already a lot of queries on the chat box. After speech of the all the resource person, we will discuss the what is to the from the respective speaker? There is one question for Dr. Manavendra Haldar, and the question from Bhavna Sharma. She is our uh, student from Faculty of Allied Health Science, ICFA University. She wrote that there are any chance to use the life attenuated vaccine as a treatment. Sir, can you highlight that? Question to Dr. Manavendra Haldar. The vaccine is, is in a very early stage at this moment. I don't have much experience on, on the vaccinations, but the work is going on at, uh, in the UK, in Oxford. Um, I think they're still in trialing process, but um, I'm not sure whether it's attenuated or not, but um, my understanding is probably um, is, it's not a live virus. Um, is, the, is the antibody they're using um, and generating the virus um, uh, from the antigen, obviously they will going to get it from there um, and they're going to produce it probably sometimes next year. So I can't really get to the final answer on that question. Sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, for Dr. Debarma, there is one question, I think, from, from nursing staff. She is from outside of the state. She wrote that if anyone donate the blood in blood donation camp after a few days, if we get information that person is COVID-19 positive, then what problem may occur, sir? Dr. Debarma, sir, please. Can you please repeat the question? She wrote that if anyone donate blood in donation camp after few days, if we get information that person is COVID-19 positive, then what problem may occur, sir? Oh, see, uh, when you tell it, uh, this is a critical question and nicely asked questions. When young blood is collected uh, by, uh, when, by donations or something like that, uh, that, that, that is a lapse of period where we process it. Uh, so it probably takes five to seven days to process and to be ready to be transferred to someone else. So if I get or we get the report uh, within this time, uh, so we can just segregate and uh, dispose the blood. That is one issue. And information to the uh, to the authority who has collected the blood is very important in these situations. And uh, uh, see, see uh, if it is uh, within this lapses period, then probably we can dispose, dispose of that. But if you don't get the report early uh, about the positivity positivity of that of that particular donor, so that starts a problem probably. And uh, uh, this is a tricky situation uh, definitely. So probably uh, in the window period where we are storing the blood, if we get the report that, that the donor is positive, then we can handle the blood and dispose it well. Professor Halda can uh, highlight something about this uh, point too. I, I think uh, you were very correct in that, but sometimes it is the timing is very important. Hello. 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 Yes, sir. 
can we connect to hello yes yes i can hear hello yes hello yes we are listening please continue okay okay i think um, i haven't got much experience on that particular questions but i think it's very interesting to discuss um when the blood was taken from that patient how many yes, days yes. after the infection happens it might be good that blood can be useful for treating the patient in the intensive care unit because we need the antibody which that blood had and we can use that blood to treat the patient in the intensive care unit and which has been trial i think is going on at this moment in our place yes, well. what is the plan now? absolutely absolutely so this is quite interesting to know exactly how far and probably if we can see whether there is any antibody in that blood that can be useful as well so yeah hello hello yeah can you connect to the question madam hello hello yes devan are you there to connect babri mohan madam definitely some technical problem we are facing so there is another question for dr manavendra haldar sir the question has come from dipjyoti dipjyoti bhomik he is our student from faculty of allied health science he is telling that sir do you face the problem of comorbidity case and comorbid case and non comorbid case in your country for in this covid situation specially for the emergency situation yes we we have seen uh, quite a lot of patients with, without any comorbidities um they're coming up and we have seen special group of patient here who are black and asian minorities group in this country and they are more prone though they may not have any illness but they can come up with uh, what severe covid infected patient i have personally seen very young caucasian white person having a covid 19 and severe in severe respiratory failure so you can see a lot of patients without any comorbidities as well but the chances of survival obviously will be better if someone haven't got any comorbidities that's what i can tell thank you sir thank you there is one question hello the question came from one icu in charge of karnataka to dr haldar <coughs> sir in in covid 19 case especially in the case of icu can they use the prednisolon i have, uh, we we don't use uh, we don't use prednisolone here what we use is very simple and very cost effective drugs called dexamethasone and which is being used uh, quite routinely here and uh, dexamethasone 6 mg either you can give intravenous or oral route and usually it need to be given for 10 days and which was found very effective we use methyl prednisolone obviously as i mentioned earlier before when we got this cytokine storm in that case methyl prednisolone was quite effective as well but never use prednisolone as such so thank you thank you very much there is one question from i think it is from kolkata 
that it is from a nursing sister uh, to Dr. Debbarma. Sir, you said for isolation zone and non-isolation zone, but when patient comes to the COVID hospital, in that time, the patient, all patients are in non-isolation zone who are in a asymptomatic. Sir, do you think that from that place, the uh, infection chance or rate will be high to Dr. Debbarma? Or to Dr. Haldar, question is also both for you. I think I think when the patient comes to hospitals, there should be a triaging process. Obviously, if someone has got COVID symptoms, unless otherwise proved, we have to make it thinking that the patient is positive and we can all keep going into the same place. So, so symptomatic patients having symptoms and also those who are positive will be going in the same place. And then once the test been done for the symptomatic patients, if they're negative, then they will be separated from that area. And then if they remain positive, they will stay with that group of patients. So I think it's a very tricky at this time actually to do the triaging, but the, there should be a guidance for the triaging for COVID and non-COVID patients with symptoms, without symptoms. Thank you. Sir, another question from Mr. Devot Jyoti Biswas to Dr. Haldar. <coughs> How the healthcare providers will continue documentation in ICO while they are with PPE? Because the document also can spread the coronavirus, will stay on documents for a long time, can spread among the healthcare providers. This is quite interesting topics. I mean, we are already facing that issues as well, especially um, while we are dealing with patients with a PPE, we are not able to do the documentation. So we have our assistants who will be outside that area and who will be looking at through the window and putting the documentations in, into the computer computer making our documentations much easier rather than carrying the papers. As you mentioned, the papers will be carrying all the infections and viruses. So either the paperwork should be outside the area or you should be have computer in your workplace inside the area where the inside the area, some people who are not dealing with the patients will be able to do the documentations in the computer. So if you have used paperwork, you have to keep it outside, but somebody else will be doing the paperwork. Does it make sense? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> sir, there is another question from uh, New Delhi. One clinician, he has, re he has asked to Dr. Haldar that, that sir, do you think that this type of social distancing and the mask, what we are using in India, is it very effective to stop the corona infection? What do you think in perspective of the UK perspective? Can you highlight that? This is very interesting. I think this kind of decisions comes up from the government level, what, what you were and what should you be doing it in your uh, country. In UK, at this moment, the recent guidance came up, the social distancing from two meters is came down to one meter plus. I think it's a lot of political discussions going on as well, because yeah. unless you have a reduced distance, you can't open the shops, your economy is going down. So they are constant with the healthcare professionals, to make sure a safe area we can produce, a bubble we can produce, so that this infection doesn't spread too much. In scientific way, the virus, once you do the coughing or talking, it can spread two meters. 
that is the scientific evidence so okay. if you reduce your 2 meter distance you have to wear some kind of ppe either face mask obviously face mask is quite good protecting yourself and also you can protect to other people i think it's a good practice uh, to use ppe if you are going to a very compact place where you can't really maintain the social distancing wearing the face mask will be mandatory thank you thank you sir sir uh, there is one question another question for you from a nursing staff uh, sir what is the proper structure of any blood donation camp in this situation which part we should take care for secure blood donation because many people are scared to donate the blood now and the state like tripura is now scaring for the blood and for treating the emergency patient in any hospital is now in a very vulnerable condition sir can you highlight on that i won't be able to tell you the exactly blood donations but what i can tell the things what we are doing at this moment it should be as normal as possible it's not a different situation situation is the covid infection i think the infection control policy is very important at this time it's not the patient how we can infection we can protect your ourselves and we can protect the patients so two things you have to always think of if someone comes for blood donations those the healthcare assistant taking the blood from the patient they should be protected they should wear yeah, their proper ppe which is in the guidelines in that workplace for here i've seen those who are taking blood they are wearing face mask they are wearing a gloves and there will be a plastic apron covered up with their dress they are not wearing full uh, full length uh, uh, apron or gowns or anything like that so it depends on where you are working your pp guidance will be according to that so if you are taking a blood or giving blood your pp will be accordingly prepared for the area so there should be a guidance from your own place sir thank you for your uh, fantastic answer sir another question for you on perspective of the british healthcare sector one of my student from ikfai department of healthcare management sonali sonali has asked the question sir being a healthcare manager how you think that it is possible for giving the patient centric treatment in this time patient centric treatment in this time how you do in uk patient centric treatment is always has to be the same as before there is no difference at this time in pandemic or non pandemic Good. obviously your workforce is very important at this point of care because this lot of healthcare will be off sick and we also face the same issues so we have to recruit patients from the other departments where you required more you have to get people from the other departments retrain them and get them work together so that you can have more people working for the patient's care in that area so i think on healthcare management's perspective they need to think of redeploying people from those who are working only managerial work whether they can help in patient's care or not some of the doctors probably on higher grade they are not on direct patient contact so they should come down as well so that they can start working with the patients not probably as as expert but they can help like giving the patients care in terms of writing a prescription or or just giving a, a bowl of food to them to help them so every help is very important at this pandemic time so i think redeployment of staff is very important and think of from the managerial point of view yes thank you sir thank you very much this is the last question to you from my side what i feel in present situation especially in when i am in the north is what i feel sir the suppose the patient with having the dialysis problem is going to hospital and having the panic in nature 
that whether i am i will be affected by covid or not because dialysis is very much essential for every uh, kidney failure patient so do you think the panic is justified for them can it possible that if the hospital is not covid so can it possible that the dialysis patient may get affected on that i think this is very valid uh, for the patient's point of view to be panic because the hospital is all source of infections going there um, from hospital's point of view i think they have got the responsibility to protect the patients as well so yes. they need to have a system like what we are doing at this moment is green and red pathways so we have a different sites in the hospitals where is the green zone so there will be no infected patients going there in that particular area so like in dialysis area i think they should make a green zone so all the patients yes. who are coming they should have covid positive or covid negative they should be tested before coming there all the patients should be have fully mask ppe hand washing all the measures all the healthcare professionals should also follow the same infection control like wearing washing their hands properly wearing face mask when they are in contact with the patients that will protect the patients so these all give the assurance to the patient while they see the professionals they are coming with fully protections patients are feeling assured as well i think so this is lot of thinking lot of process it's a hard work i understand but yes. i think it will be in future covid we don't know how many years will we have to live with covid so i think we have to start thinking very carefully now what should be the future plan for covid and non covid in a hospital situations thank you thank you sir sir now i will request because due to the technical issue we cannot connect with mrs bapi mohajan we thanks to tripura train nursing uh, association <coughs> now i request our respected register dr a ranganat to give the vote of thanks for today's online webinar thank you swami ji good evening to all respected provost chancellor professor diplo haldar sir dr chinmay biswas dr manavender haldar dr rajesh dev verma and ms bapi mahajan even though we are expect expected that she will be the delivering a webinar she didn't uh, may not be able to do on behalf of xy family i am honored to propose vote of thanks for this webinar so as a common man in this uh, covid era we are all frightened we are not able to think that we can go on the touch the covid patient and all. the doctors and nursing professionals and medical professionals are supporting everybody so from my side we are all grateful to them for their risk and saving to us so when we come to this webinar this webinar is meant for bring uh, bringing all the medical professionals together and providing them inputs to bring again the strength in their function so the society can be secure so we are thankful to all the members especially dr chinmay biswas ji for his words to encourage the mayor the ikfai university tripura being a part of this webinar and making this as a successful event we are thankful to today's chief speaker dr manavendra haldar ji for his valuable suggestions to all the participants by sharing his experiences which are rich in nature so all the people got i hope good strength in continuing the fight of covid 19 thank you sir once again on behalf of ikfai family i heard your name in the last five years professor chancellor sir today first time i see you thank you sir
thank you for your presence and uh, contribution to our tripura's uh, medical professional development thank you thank you very much thank dr rajesh devarma ji he also shared his experiences and given lot of uh, medical terminology i was listening for me it will be difficult to understand but i see the way people ask the questions so they are following you and uh, they are able to meet the requirements so the purpose of today program is successful by reaching all the people from bangalore delhi and all so the mission of ikfa university to learning to lead so when all the people will learn they will be leading the show and fighting with the covid 19 i hope all of us will be coming out as well as possible from this covid fear so once again thank you to all the participants who asked the question and also make this uh, event successful once again thank you thank you sir but uh, after this customary uh, it is uh, we I, we are very much grateful that we got dr manavendra haldar after his valuable time sir thank you very much for your enlightened speech and to run the department in emergency and critical care we request you on behalf of ikai family sir please be with us and give your suggestion how to improve this critical care technologies in this state of the northeast we are closing the webinar today thank you thank you everybody for present in this webinar thank you all the participants